you know, to, I mean, what, what goes into that process of striking a balance? We have had a, a wonderful discussion here about the problems and, and what have you, but I am trying to figure out um, when, you, when you sit down to, at the table, um, are there certain principles that may be guiding, guiding principles so that you can even have a way of weighing what you are doing so that you come out with, and I am not asking you for your final solution, I am just trying to figure out what, is it, what are the kinds of things that you that you think that you think that you all would be looking at, I mean, and concerned about, and that like, again, those guiding kind of principles. That's an excellent question, um, Congressman. I, I think that the uh, starting, for example, with the ban on general solicitation, if we eliminate the ban so that offerings, private offerings, could be made to accredited investors through publicity, um, through advertising, um, and the like, I would. I would want to know whether we are confident that the group that is getting sold to um, is the group that doesn't need protection and that the people that are getting sold to are, in fact, accredited investors. Um, so those are, those are things that I think will be important in the mix. If they don't need the protections of the securities laws, then it may make sense to make it easier to reach them. If they are the group that needs the protections of the securities laws, because either they are not really accredited and they are and they're getting, um, they have fraudulent brokers who are putting them into deals they shouldn't be in. So I am very concerned about that factor. So I would like to, those, that, and so in that area, those are the, those will be going into our, the, the staff's recommendation. On the 500 holder limit, I would like to know um, what the investor makeup is in these companies. And I would like to know what the, what the characteristics are of these companies. Are these companies that are real companies? Um, are they more fraudulent companies that, that are trading in, in, the, you know, in the sort of dark markets and it held in street name? And you don't really they have thousands of investors, but they only count as 200 because they are held through brokers? Or are these companies that are the engines of growth and they have 499 holders and they can't raise another dime because they can't get one more holder? Um, and they have those are 499 actual investors. I think those are important points. And if they if the answers come out, um, you know, we may need different answers for different kinds of, of companies, different situated companies, companies who go dark because they they are, are are held through street name might need a different test than companies that are held by investors directly um, and are bumping up against the limit and, and, and are in desperate need of capital. Now. With regard to those who need to be protected, will you be looking at? I mean, you said that you would you're concerned about them, but then going back to some questions that Mr. McHenry asked about who it is that is in need of protection, um, is that? I mean, do you all see that changing? I mean, in other words, is that something that you is that a definition that you might want to revisit at some point? I am just curious. Well, the, the accredited investor definition was amended in Dodd-Frank right. to change the net worth test to eliminate the, the primary residence. And Dodd-Frank otherwise says that we are not to revise that definition, I believe, is for four years. Mm -hmm. And GAO is doing a study of, of the definition in the meantime. So I don't see that as a definition we are changing on the, on the immediate horizon, but it is a definition that does need to be a living, breathing definition as mm -hmm. investors change. For example, should there be a special accreditation for people who are um, chartered financial analysts who don't happen to have a lot of money for some reason, things like that. There might make, it might make sense to add people to the list. I see. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. You go back. I thank the ranking member. Uh, I have only one question for you as a quick follow-up. Uh, the, the current statute envisions that all investors are in one pool. So if a company has no program for their employees to own stock, no uh, any form of, of stock uh, options, they can have 500 street name investors, which could be thousands of actual investors through there. Well, if a company has 1,000 employees they want to offer, they have no choice but to in fact, avail themselves of an alternative, because the same 500 applies regardless. Isn't that true? 
it is correct that the same 500 applies. I think that for some companies that are, that, that are traded in the over-the-counter markets, not on exchanges, they are held in street name, even though they are not reporting companies. Those companies could also have their employees hold in street name in theory. Um, those are not the kinds of companies we are really talking about at this hearing. I think the companies you are talking about are the companies that are pre-IPO companies who are growing um, organically. And, and for those companies, the employees being counted you know, certainly weighs into a, a, a meaningful cap. Okay, and, and that was a, just the point that I wanted to make sure we understood, that when we talk about protections, it is in fact not a fixed protection. It can be a very large number by comparison if employees are not offered, and a very small one if there are hundreds of employees in that mix. That is right. Thank you. And with that, I thank you for your participation in this panel and your patience uh, through all of it. And uh, we will take a five-minute recess to set up the second panel. Thank, thank you. you.
thank you all for your patience. I noticed, uh, I believe, all of you in the audience, so uh, you know our questions. Now the, now the question, of course, will be, will your answers be similar to the first panel? There we go. I knew I would get a laugh if I worked hard on it. Uh, we now recognize our second panel. Uh, Mr. Barry Silbert is the CEO of Second Market, an alternative trading system, and a young entrepreneur in his own right. Mr. Uh, Eric Coaster is the co-founder of Lari? Zar Zarli, uh, sorry, I should have read that, uh, Incorporated. Dr. Richard Ron is Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute, and Mr. Jonathan Macy is a law professor at Yale University. Last but not least, the, uh, the Honorable Raul Camp uh, Campos is the former Commissioner of the Security Exchange Commission. And as you saw in the first panel, our rules require all witnesses be sworn, so please rise to take the oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record uh, reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, and as in the first panel, uh, we, we will take five minutes on our side, and I will try not to cut anyone off uh, mid-question, and I won't cut any of you off mid-answer. Uh, however, there is a lot more of you. So on your opening statements, please limit yourself to five minutes. And with that, Mr. Silbert. Good afternoon, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. My name is Barry Silbert, and I am the founder and CEO of Second Market. I am grateful for the opportunity to testify this afternoon regarding the future of capital formation, an important issue that directly impacts job growth and U.S. global competitiveness. I founded Second Market in 2004 to create a transparent, centralized, and independent market for alternative investments, including stock and private companies. We have grown rapidly and now have 135 employees in New York and San Francisco and have completed several billions of dollars in transactions. We are a registered broker-dealer of FINRA and an SEC-registered alternative trading system. Second Market's unique business model is premised on transparency and independence. We do not engage in proprietary trading meaning we do not use our own balance sheet to purchase assets that are put up for sale in the second market. Up until a decade ago, <clears throat> fast-growing startups followed a very similar capital formation path. They raised venture capital, a few rounds of venture capital, and went public in about five years. For several decades, these small-cap companies could thrive in the public markets with research coverage, brokers, and market makers driving investor interest in these companies. The public market allowed companies like Starbucks, <clears throat> Intel, Genentech, and Dell to grow from small cap companies into job creating economic powerhouses. However, the capital formation process has evolved over the past decade, and the public markets are no longer receptive to small companies. It now takes companies twice as long, nearly 10 years, to grow to reach the public market. A number of factors have contributed to the systemic problems that, that exist in the public market. These include a shift from stockbrokers to online trading, the inability for market makers to profit for, some, for supporting smaller cap stocks the lack of research coverage on smaller companies, <clears throat> and finally, the implementation of Sarbanes-Oxley, which made it cost prohibitive to be a public small company. You can read more about these issues in my written testimony. One other important systemic change is the emergence of computer-driven high-frequency trading. Although it brings liquidity to the public markets, these traders ignore small cap companies and have contributed to the, ca the casino-like trading atmosphere in the markets. Disturbingly, it is estimated that nearly 60 percent of public trading volume is being done by computer algorithms, which has caused the average time that a public share of stock is held to decline from five years in 1970 to less than three months today. The small cap market is a vital part of the capital formation process, and the failure of the U.S. capital markets to support these companies inhibits our ability to create jobs, innovate, and grow. Consequently, a new growth market must emerge to support these companies. And I believe that second market is that market. Chairman Shapiro has said that the SEC is reviewing the regulatory landscape to lessen the burden on private companies. President Obama has also ordered a review of government regulations that place an unnecessary burden on businesses. I applaud the commitment of the SEC and the administration. I believe there are two regulatory hurdles in particular that must be reexamined. First is the so-called 500 shareholder rule. 
As discussed previously, pay structure at startup companies generally involves giving employees below market salaries coupled with stock options. These options enable employees to realize the financial upside while enabling the startup to hire top talents even though they don't have the cash to pay market salaries. As a result, this rule has created a disincentive for private companies to hire new employees or acquire other businesses for stock, as the companies are fearful of taking on too many shareholders and thus triggering a public filing requirement. The second rule that must be reexamined is the prohibition against general solicitations. Given that only accredited investors are eligible to purchase unregistered securities, such as private company stock, we should strive to maximize the pool of investors that are aware of any offering. In short, let everyone see, but only let accredited investors invest. Given the foregoing, I would re respectfully propose the following rule changes. First, a significant increase or elimination of the 500 shareholder threshold. Second, if the threshold is increased but not eliminated, an exemption for accredited investors from that count. The SEC has already determined that these investors do not require registration level protection, and therefore, this exemption would be consistent with the SEC's investor protection mandate. Third, if the threshold is increased but not eliminated, an exemption for employee owners from the shareholder count. And finally, an elimination of the, on the prohibition for, of general solicitation, provided that the ultimate purchaser is, in fact, an accredited investor. I believe the problems facing growth stage companies must be addressed and failure to support a new growth market will significantly limit access to capital, restrict job growth, stifle innovation, and weaken the U.S. globally. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this important hearing. I would also like to thank the SEC for, for considering these important rule changes. Thank you. Mr. Coaster. Hello. Thank you, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. My name is Eric Custer, and I am one of the founders of Zarly. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Custer, and I am one of the founders of Zarly, a location-based, real-time, community-powered marketplace launching, crossing your fingers, nationwide this month. I greatly appreciate the time to come before you today. I am what Mr. Silbert earlier described, a hopeful, hopeful fast-growing company. And as a former startup lawyer turned entrepreneur myself, I have had the unique opportunity to advise, counsel, and educate thousands of entrepreneurs and early-stage businesses as well as live the life of a business owner myself. Therefore, I have seen some of the challenges affecting today's entrepreneurs and small businesses firsthand. My testimony today is aimed to highlight specific concerns from the mouths of entrepreneurs that affect our, the ability of our young companies to hire and increase jobs, to innovate, to compete globally, and to grow our broader economy. Today, I would briefly like to tell the story of why it is important to act to decrease friction for entrepreneurs and small businesses to look, increase liquidity in our private markets and to re regain the leadership position to support early stage businesses. Others on this panel may be better suited to provide information such as data, research and analysis on broader market trends, but my purpose as an entrepreneur here today is to share how some of these regulations can impact our ability to fund and grow these emerging small businesses. Today's economy is very different, and entrepreneurs and small businesses have unique opportunities. In speaking with entrepreneurs and myself, I believe there are a few key lessons that we can learn from the proverbial entrepreneurial field. First, building a small business today is actually cheaper and easier than it has ever been before in our nation's history. Second, and a big however, building a business is not cheap and it still requires substantial resources and, and investment to make these businesses thrive. Number three, Raising funds in itself is difficult and has become more difficult given the decreased liquidity of our banking system. And identifying prospective investors is extremely distracting to the task of building and starting a new growth business. And fourth, the most important lesson learned from entrepreneurs today is that removing friction, friction in business, friction in commerce, friction in human capital, and important to this committee today, fr regulatory friction is crucial to be able for these businesses to do more with less. I would like to tell a brief story about my current business, Zarly, and why I think that removing friction is so important to the success of other businesses like ours. My business was just an idea 11 weeks ago. In the last 11 weeks, we have been able to hire a team of nearly a dozen individuals, nearly 50 contractors, open two offices, deploy a robust technology solution, 
raise funding, and hopefully file several patents and trademarks to ready a marketing effort to take the nation by storm, we hope, this month. Our goal is to be, with some luck and support of customers, the next Amazon, eBay, or Groupon. The important lesson to learn about Zarly is that we have launched this market in a very short and rapid time, leveraging the speeds and the trends in industry. But what is also important to know is that other businesses may not have the, the advantages that Azarly has by having a reformed corporate lawyer on their team to navigate some of the difficult legal issues. So the story of Zarly and its rapid growth and hopeful success from here highlights some several lessons. It highlights that the regulatory schemes are very complex for early stage businesses and are distracting to their success. Sufficient funding resources are crucial to their speed, and there are dozens of ways for these businesses to trip up on the existing regulatory scheme. So alternative funding schemes are important to find and to, to reduce the operational expense of taking a business from a startup to a successful business venture. Therefore, I would like to propose and encourage the Commission and this entire committee to look at four important things. Continue to examine private company fundraising and financing regulations, including things such as general solicitations and the ability of private investors to be de deemed accredited when they are sophisticated investors. Second, to explore more options like private market regulations, like my colleague Mr. Silver, Ms. Silberg's second market, which can increase liquidity for lower tier businesses in the chain, such as myself. Third, to explore the option for community funded or funding organizations where small dollar amounts contributed by the community can be used to fund businesses like mine. And finally, while not in the purview of this committee, I think it is important that the immigration reform impacting startups, such as the Startup Visa Program and H 1B visa extensions, be explored. I want to express my gratitude for being here today, and thank you very much for exploring these important issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Dr. Rahn. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and other members of the committee, thank you very much for inviting me to be with you here today. Um, I want to take a different tack. I want to challenge the conventional wisdom. Uh, we have a regulatory structure with the SEC which is basically designed in the 1930s. And the question is, that, is that really appropriate for today's information age? If you had to start uh, Doctor, could you pull your mic a little closer, please? Thank Excuse you. Me. If you had to start over again, let's assume we had no SEC, how would you design it? Would you create one? Would it look anything like the SEC we have today? There has been a lot of evidence that the SEC is somewhat dysfunctional. We have been losing global market share. We have had the debate about the IPOs and how much that is, the, the reduction in IPOs is due to the SEC and so forth. Um, one thing strikes me. A huge portion of the SEC budget goes into enforcement. If the other divisions of the SEC were doing their job, it would seem that we would have very few enforcement needs. Um, and is this really the way we want to go? There is a theory in economics, the whole public choice school of economics, that looks at the motivations of people within bureaucracies. Um, in the uh, the whole area of cost-benefit analysis, I think, is an undermanaged activity within the SEC. We have a basic conflict. The SEC is an agency primarily uh, driven by lawyers, relatively few economists. And as an economist, I have a certain bias here. But when I have been on a, a board of a regulatory agency and I have seen the problem that the regulators, of course, keep their jobs by coming up with more regulations and rules. I am not saying they are of evil intent, but this is just the nature of the way people operate. And the job of really the chief economist role is to say no to rules that aren't justified. But they have to really be independent from the rest of the staff in order to do an objective job. We don't see it at the, at, at the SEC or most other government regulatory agencies. Um, and I think we have to rethink the whole structural model of how we set these agencies up, and particularly the SEC, to give more balance to really looking at the cost and benefits of every possible regulation, every piece of paper, uh, everything that comes out. Um, <clears throat> one example is the whole area of accredited investor. And this started off with perfectly good intent of trying to keep the uh, allowing people who should be able to take care of themselves 
to be in without having to be regulated. But we look at what's happened. Right now, we only have about 2 percent of the U.S. population that qualifies as an accredited investor. Does this make any sense? You can have a rock musician or a sports figure who meets the income and net worth standards, but a young uh, tax attorney or a professor of finance doesn't. Does that make sense? Um, I don't think we ought to have a system where we say only 2 percent of the population is so-called so smart enough to be able to uh, be accredited investors. Uh, we ought to have at least 50 percent of the population, or I think a lot more. Most people can make judgments. People make mistakes. We find even the richest and most sophisticated make mistakes. We have all made mistakes. But that doesn't mean the government ought to prohibit us from having the opportunities that only the uh, wealthiest among us have. The insider trading. We've, everybody's been against insider trading. It seems logical to oppose insider trading. Um, but there's a lot of now academic evidence, scholars, law and economic scholars who've studied it, and say, no, this is actually causing us more problems. We get into the whole area of what I call vague law with insider trading. The SEC brings many insider trading actions but they are unsuccessful in the vast majority of these, and part is because we can't even define as, uh, insider trading. And so I argue that we really need to go back to square one here, think of how we set up these organizations to truly protect investors and uh, not get hung up with the things that we have done in the past which may not be sensible. Thank you very much. I do appreciate your, uh, the opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ron. And uh, Mr. Macy. Thank you. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here, and I enjoyed very much listening to uh, the questions and the answers, particularly the questions in the, in the first panel, which I thought were extremely well informed, and I wanted to, um, uh, to elaborate on some of the points that were, uh, that were made uh, in, in light of my own views of some of the issues that are facing us in terms of, in terms of capital formation. First, um, we have two uh, competing sets of statistics uh, I just, uh, uh, with regard to uh, initial public offerings in the United States. And I want to make it clear that both of these sets of statistics are interesting and important uh, and accurate. Um, one set of uh, statistics uh, introduced by the chairman uh, is uh, the, uh, the idea that the, the number of U.S. public offerings over the last 20 years has been, has been in decline. Uh, that statistic becomes more uh, interesting, uh, I think. Uh, it's an interesting statistic, but it becomes even more uh, interesting in light of the, the uh, article from the Atlantic Monthly that the ranking minority member mentioned that says that while the number of initial public offerings may be going down, the amount of money raised in public offerings, not just the number of deals, but the actual amount of money has been, has been going up. Um, it, what that means, of course, is that uh, because both of these sets of statistics are accurate, uh, is that we have had fewer uh, public offerings, but each of the public offerings that we have had has been raising, on average, more money uh, than investors have in the past. And what this means, uh, I think, uncontrovertibly, is that the capital formation process has come to be dominated by um, only the very largest issuers. That is to say, with respect to the statistics in the Atlantic about, about the amount of money raised in public offerings, one offering of $500 million counts exactly the same as 100 offerings of $5 million. And uh, uh, I think this raises an extremely important point about the disproportionate impact of the regulations that we have. Our regulations have benefits and they have costs. The benefits are generally the same for all investors and all firms. The costs, however, fall disproportionately on small and medium-sized firms 
firms because they take the form of a fixed cost. Uh, so it's, it's it, the, the relative uh, burden on a very large company of going public uh, uh, hasn't gone up very much, but the burden on small and medium-sized companies has gone up quite a bit. And, and really, if you compare the industrial structure of the United States with respect to job formation, with respect to diversity, both uh, in terms of product lines and in terms of technology and in terms of geography, Around, across the country, the real strength of the, of the U.S. economy has been that we have a very large uh, number of small and medium-sized firms, and relative to European economies uh, and Asian economies, um, our economy is much better, uh, our, the firms in our economy are much better distributed between small, medium, and large firms rather than having, uh, as we see in, in other countries, uh, uh, no middle-sized firms or very few, and, and firms disproportionately collected at the small and the large end of the continuum. And I think that it would be very useful uh, in thinking about the reform of these, of, of these SEC rules, particularly uh, the 50 shareholder ban and the general solicitation ban, um, to think about the disproportionate impact of these rules on small and medium-sized companies uh, and, and, and to think about the idea that in terms of job creation, we really do uh, not only want to encourage the the, uh, the, the total amount of money raised in public offerings, but we also want to uh, increase the number of companies, the number of entrepreneurs, the number of businesses that have access to the capital markets. So with that, I will spend my last minute talking about a couple of specific things. One, the, the general solicitation ban uh, and the, uh, and the uh, 500 uh, shareholder ban. Uh, I don't think that either of these provisions help uh, small or medium-sized businesses. I don't think either of these provisions protects, uh, protects investors. I also want to point out as a factual matter that the SEC's justification for the general solicitation ban uh, has changed quite a bit over time. Now it is some idea that we need to protect investors. It used to be uh, the, the, the original justification for the general solicitation ban was that we needed to um, uh, stop investors from becoming too enthusiastic about securities offerings, and if we, if we allowed a general uh, offering uh, to take place, then there would, be, uh, there would be a kind of a consumer frenzy uh, that, would, uh, that would occur. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for, for, the, for this time. I appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Commissioner Campos. Good afternoon. Uh, I wish to thank uh, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and the other distinguished committee members for the invitation to testify today. Uh, my name is Rowell Campos. I'm currently a partner with a national law firm of Locke, Lord, Bissell, and Lydell, where I practice securities law. I represent businesses and individuals. I come before you today not as an expert or an advocate on a, particularly, on a particular regulatory change, uh, in particular the ones that the committee has, uh, is considering. But instead, I testify today from the perspective of a former SEC commissioner. Like you and the SEC currently, during my tenure as an SEC commissioner, I often face the difficult challenge of how best to reform and improve securities laws and regulations. I learned firsthand how difficult it can be to balance the goals mandated by Congress, protecting investors, but also facilitating capital formation and preserving the integrity of the markets. With your permission, my testimony today has two modest goals, presenting a very short discussion of factors and considerations that must be balanced to produce sound regulations, and offering observations and suggestions to assist the SEC to achieve appropriate reform uh, of current securities regulation. First, let me briefly uh, begin by discussing investor protection. In my experience, this concept, when raised, regularly produces cynicism and the disbelief that this is a serious goal in today's complex environment. Many seem to believe that the concept of investor protection is archaic and long ago ceased to be useful, that it is a musty relic of a bygone era, the market crash of 1929. I respectfully disagree. I submit that investor protection remains today as important as it was 80 years ago when Congress made it the fundamental underpinning of the securities laws. As a commissioner, I was often asked with respect to investor protection, well, what investors exactly? And 
do investors really need much protection? Certainly the term investor is very broad. Congress and the SEC have never made a distinction among the different categories of investors, which include institutional investors, i.e., pension plans, which can represent public and private employees, and often include in professional investors, pr private asset managers, and hedge funds. And finally, there is the distinction of retail investors, the everyday person who holds a brokerage account or who tries to manage his or her retirement plan. During my tenure at the SEC, I was privileged to represent the agency in the international arena, where I learned firsthand that our markets are unique. Securities markets in Europe and Asia are comprised almost exclusively of institutional and professional investors. In the U.S., however, retail investors provide a significant portion of the capital that is invested. Retail investors, therefore, add a depth of liquidity and offer a diversification to the investor base to the U.S. markets that cannot be found elsewhere in the world. Indeed, the liquidity and the diversity of the U.S. markets help convince many foreign investors to invest in the U.S. As a commissioner, I worried most about retail investors, as the others often have strong associations and lobbyists to present their views and their needs to the commission and to the SEC staff. So, so retail investors, however, are the ones who most quickly can leave the markets when the problems arise. And as was discussed in the first panel, when there is a crash, when there is a problem, those particular investors flee the, the fastest. Let me move to um, some, some ideas that I have regarding the situation that we have today. The SEC has stated in the panel very clearly that they are willing to look at these particular issues, that they are willing to consider reform. In fact, they're, uh, Chairman Shapiro and, and uh, Meredith Cross, uh, the head of Corfin, were very clear about that. However, uh, there has always been, and I submit continues today, a deep annoyance that the SEC takes too long to consider new ideas and recommendations for improvement. This, is, this problem arises from, I submit, resources, insufficient staff that have, that have other skills that, are, that go beyond being lawyers. So I would submit that that is an area of consideration for this particular committee. And with that, I see my time is up, and I thank you for uh, permitting me to uh, make these statements. I certainly appreciate the panel's uh, testimony, I, and it is very informative and helpful for policymakers in, here in Congress to hear from you. We uh, will lead off with uh, five minutes from Mr. Meehan of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for this distinguished panel again, in addition to those who, uh, who came before us. And, and I am struck by the remarkable amount of willingness on this panel to be taking creative looks at where we ought to be going with the SEC. Mr. Silbert, I had the opportunity to spend a little time paying some attention to uh, your business model, very impressive in terms of but what struck me is the idea that you really have created a market for sophisticated investors, people who take the time to understand that there's a lot of different kinds of securities out there that can become uh, you know, able to be liquid, which both creates liquidity, uh, it also uh, allows people to participate that may not reach this, you know, this, this threshold for sophisticated investors. Can we expand the definition of sophisticated investor some way to include the kinds of people that, that, that put the sweat equity into understanding things but may not have the, the, you know, the dollars behind their name to take the risk? <clears throat> Congressman, it's, it's an interesting idea that I think has been floated over the past six months, 12 months, as this private company market has uh, has grown in, in, in value or volume. Um, you know, the way we operate right now, as as you're alluding to, you know, so we only allow accredited investors to participate. Um, and while we would certainly kind of welcome the expansion of the addressable universe of investors, uh, we have to comply with the current regulations. Um, you know, the idea of a test, uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a viable one, but it, then it comes down to, you know, who administers the test and questions, things like that. Dr. Ryan, you had talked about this 2 percent factor. What could, what could be some of the criteria that would be able to be utilized in this uh, to, to create a class that would, would be able to, to invest without having the the main thing we want to know is, have people actually paid attention? 
all of us make all kinds of investments. We buy houses and automobiles. Uh, one can go to Las Vegas and gamble and weigh their fortune. You have to. You don't have any net worth requirements on that. We have people are totally unsophisticated. If we came up with the notion of accredited gambler, people would look at that as laughable. We have uh, uh, the state lotteries, which I look at as a total financial ripoff. But I, I think the main thing, rather than trying to say you have to have a certain net worth or a certain education, if the SEC gave a piece of paper to everybody who is going to invest, or if we had one, and it put, first pointed out the low probability of new ventures, um, you know, give whatever statistics we have on that, warn people against it, like we do lots of other types of warnings from everything from cigarette labels and everything else, and say you have to do your own due diligence. Just the mere existence of the SEC adds risk. Look at all the investors in the Madoff pyramid scheme who claimed one reason they felt confident was because the SEC exists. And rather than doing their own due diligence. And obviously, we have got to have a way to protect people who really can't do any kind of evaluation on their own. But the vast majority of Americans, I think, uh, have the, uh, the brains and the skills to be able to do this and to rule all, all but 2 percent of our citizens. Because what that does is discriminates against young people and others who want to get rich. We are saying now only the people who are already rich can have the access to the best opportunities. That seems to me totally un-American. Uh, Professor Macy, and you were precluded from getting in the full scope of your testimony by the five minutes, but I, had, I enjoyed reading your testimony. And I was a little bit, in some points, I was struck by your notion uh, that tied into one of the questions I asked about China. But the idea, the markets have changed dramatically. Uh, in, in years since World War II. And you made a comment. You said, you know, the SEC needs to make a clean break with the past, relating to the fact that um, the capital markets uh, aren't the only ones in the United States now. We're starting, we're turning into a global marketplace. There's more than one cop on the beat. Where do we go? Well, here's, here's would, you, would you push your, your talk? Sorry. Um, as I, I think I, I try to say in my testimony, I actually I think the people at the SEC are extremely bright and talented and well-meaning, honest, full of integrity. Um, but there, there are, uh, uh, I think that, that we, and when I say we, I mean those of us in academia, the people, frankly, who oversee, the people in Congress who oversee what the SEC uh, uh, do kind of inadvertently give these folks very perverse incentives. So, for example, um, we heard in the first panel this morning something that, that we, we, we uh, always hear from the SEC when they are uh, being questioned. They say, we are doing a really good job. Look at the dollar amount in fines. We find uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, this huge amount of money. We have been, we've, we've increased every year the amount of, of fines that we return $2 billion, of, dollar, two billion uh, of these dollars to the U.S. Treasury. Um, if that's, so we have set this up as the criteria by which we judge the SEC. That means that what they are going to do is go after the biggest fine they can. That does not help the small or medium-sized investor. The small and medium-sized investor, by definition, loses small and medium amounts of, of money. We need to provide, so we're, we're giving the SEC very uh, perverse incentives. Another example is the U.S., not just the SEC, but the, our society generally is much more kind of, if you'll pardon the expression, lawyered up uh, than other societies. Uh, and uh, a lot of what the SEC does, because it is uh, much more dominated by lawyers than in any other uh, regulatory agency, either in the U.S. or in terms of its counterparts in other countries. Um, you know, if, you, if you're working at the SEC, you really cannot make a career for yourself by making the securities regulations simpler. No one wants to to hire you to work at a big Wall Street firm to to charge people a lot of money to interpret simple regulations. The more complex you make it and the fewer people who understand it, the higher value there is on your time in, in your post-SEC um, uh, 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 world. So I, I, do, I think we have these challenges that we need to, you know, it is not just a matter of, um, you know, I don't think it is at all a matter of people at the SEC having, you know, a bad 
uh, you know, having, you know, just being in favor of more regulation for kind of senseless reasons. I think there are these very kind of deeply impacted structural issues that no one had to pay any attention to in the post-war period because there weren't any other capital markets in the world. And during the Marshall Plan, as you well know, uh, Europe was being rebuilt, Asia, uh, China had not emerged as a serious economy, Japan was being completely rebuilt from the ground up. So nobody uh, 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 who wanted to raise capital in any serious way could, could avoid the, US, the United States. I think it's very important to understand that that, time's that expired. has changed. And if, if the gentleman could just wrap up. I, okay. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Cummings is re recognized for five minutes, Thank you very the ranking much. member. Mr. Camp, uh, Commissioner Campos, um, you, know, you heard Dr. Ron talk about um, only 2, two percent and, and he felt that it should be more like 50 percent of the people investing. Is that right? Mr. Dr. Ron? Yes, sir. Yeah. What's your, what's your feeling on that? I mean, you seem to be very concerned about the, the retail uh, investor. And I think what Dr. Ron is saying is that there are a lot of people who are much more sophisticated than, than maybe we think. And but I mean, I mean, what's your what's your feeling on that? In other words, how how much protection do you think is needed? And he he claims that we are basically locking people out of you know. He talked about the college kids and young people and whatever. I'm just wondering. I know you're trying to you're talking about striking a balance, but I mean, do you think we're going too far? I think I think that is the fundamental question in in regulation, and that's where and why you have such uh, such heated discussions at times because you're dealing with a broad concept, uh, investor protection, uh, within the aftermath of the 1929 crash when all these laws were written, and we have a very different world and a very different economy today. So when we talk about investor protection. Uh, I think you can achieve investor protection by finding a way to allow uh, all categories of people, uh, not necessarily through a financial test, uh, to be able to, uh, to participate in particular investments. The real, the real protection that is necessary is, is the idea that uh, investors of whatever category can get taken advantage of and can be lied to and can be cheated and can be misrepresented or critical facts can be hidden. So you can achieve this, I believe. Uh, it may be ironic to some people, but I, I favored when I was at the SEC products that allowed, uh, under the Investment Company Act, you know, mutual funds, that allowed small investors to have a taste of some of the more complex items if they were placed correctly in, in funds and, and regulated. I felt, you know, well, why should only rich people have essentially the, uh, the opportunity to have the, the, the more sophisticated ideas and, and, and complexes? So in, in, in summary, it, it, which in, in it's difficult to summarize, investor protection goes toward the idea that you need a system that people are not expecting to be guaranteed making money or profits. That's not what we have here. You know, you can pick a stock and it may not go up. It may not go up. It may go down. But the key is that in so doing, you're not going to be cheated. You know, this particular company had uh, didn't have the cash that it said it had on hand, or something else to to uh, to lure that particular investor. So that's what's important. And uh, and I think uh, I, I I would have other things to say about uh, the SEC if if uh, if ever anybody is interested now, in that. Now, one of the things you in your testimony you say that after every scandal or malfunction of capital markets, investor confidence is down and retail investors leave the market. Uh, what can the SEC do to help boost investor confidence in the United States markets, capital markets? Great question, and, and people will disagree on that one as well. But essentially, what we need today, in, in my humble view, is we need a, a market that operates in a way that doesn't uh, mystify, worry, perplex investors. I, I submit, and I think all of us would, uh, would, would say it's true, if the market plunges 80 percent, you know, stocks go from $40 to, to 2 
you know, in the space of five or ten minutes, something is wrong. And, and that is a scary event, uh, if you permit me that term. So f from the get-go, I think that the markets need, you know, careful study in that particular area. What does fast trading, what, what does trading in nanoseconds, what has that done to the average person who's, who was broker is somebody he knew in high school and, you know, has his few hundred thousand dollars, if it's that much in today's world, you know, for his savings? You know, I mean, can he, can he just, can he or she just uh, uh, invest in IBM now or, or whatever the popular stock, Apple or whatever? You know, something is going on in these markets. That needs study. That needs uh, help uh, in, my, in my view. Well, somebody asked the question. They said that we, the system is so much, things are so much different from back long ago. Do you think the SEC has kept up with that, the changes? You talk about the nanoseconds and how the, uh, the, uh, are done now today? I, I, I agree with, with what many others are saying. I think, I think the SEC was established uh, in terms of concept in the 30s. It is an agency of lawyers. We need today uh, statisticians, researchers, economists, uh, the, the sort of things that the chairman and, and, and you would like to do uh, in terms of getting the SEC to look at things quickly and efficiently requires those types of skill sets. Uh, it requires uh, resources that the agency doesn't have. What they have to do is go out, survey the, survey the system, survey the, uh, the literature, ask for comments. And then it's essentially a, a who pushes the hardest in terms of the players. A very difficult situation. Imagine a judge, you know, in a courthouse having to take opinions from 40 different sections and reading all the research themselves. It, it's, it's a very difficult uh, situation in terms of figuring out what's best for the markets, in particular when you don't have the, the, uh, the base of expertise. So I, I do believe that, the, that one great improvement would be that the agency get, get resources to have those types of people involved. Thank you very much. You go back. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mr. Coaster, um, how important is access to capital to you in this startup? Thank you very much. It's, an, it's actually an excellent question, and, uh, and I'll uh, address it personally from my current business as well as from um, advising startups over time. I, I think that it's the difference between um, you know, a, a nice side business that supports your family and, and a business that really contributes in a dramatic way to the U.S. economy. Um, you know, the business that we've started, Zarly, is a, is a business that we hope will have a dramatic impact on, uh, on markets, person-to-person -person commerce, and, and hopefully have an impact on unemployment. But that's only accessible to us because of the fact that we had forward-thinking investors to put capital in early and efficiently. Um, that allowed us to run very quickly to the point where we took a business from an idea to, to 12 weeks later to launching a very large-scale business. Now, in terms of uh, getting employees to come in for a startup, is it important to, for them to have some, some method of, of sort of a long-term payoff? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think equity is an important thing for, for people to, willing to take that kind of risk. Um, but I think that is the thing that uh, is attractive about startup companies and early stage business is that risk-reward opportunity. Now, Mr. Silbert, what exactly, what function do you provide? I mean, let us say Mr. Uh, Coaster is able to hire you know, 100 whizzes at a very low, uh, low cost, but with uh, equity in the company in the hopes that this one day goes public. The, the issue today is, it's, as I mentioned before, is taking twice as long to go public. So if you are if you're looking at a, a process that is going to take 8, 9, 10 years, that doesn't work for anybody involved in the capital formation process. It doesn't work for employees. It doesn't work for angel investors. It doesn't work for venture capitalists. So, so we identified a need to create essentially a spring training to enable companies to get to the point where they could go public, but also not have to put themselves sub, subject themselves to a lot of the negatives of being a public company, whether it is the Sarbanes-Oxley or disclosure, that type of thing. So what we have, have seen over the past couple of years is a growing number of companies have, 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 have come to appreciate that if you can allow your employees at a certain point in time, the right time, maybe it is four years, five years into it, allow them to, 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 to taste some of the value that they have created that money is actually typically reinvested back into other companies as well, and they are going to stay in for the long haul and maybe wait for that 10-year IPO uh, event. Mr. Koester, is that would that be appealing? Absolutely. And I think that, that it is appealing for employees to have that liquidity early. I also think that there is another be side benefit that is not often um, discussed besides employees, is that investors in my business are venture capitalists who have a an obligation to get a return. And obviously, if they can't get that return over time, they are slow to reinvest 
that money again into businesses. So the fact that they can gain liquidity earlier in the process, from 10 years down to 5 years potentially, allows them to have two cracks at the apple and essentially invest multiple times and kind of reap the rewards and, and double down essentially on early stage investments. Mr. Silbert. This uh, 500 shareholder rule, this, uh, uh, as the chair of the SEC call it, arbitrary number. Um, uh, you, can, can you discuss that? <clears throat> well, it, well, it was established, I guess, in the 60s, um, and it worked for decades. But if you look at that chart, um, you know, we're, we're now at a point where um, it's not working anymore. And you know, what, the, what the number should become, should, it, should there be a number, I don't know. Um, but what we, what we do know is it's a major issue. And, you know, as I mentioned in my, in my remarks, we, we certainly support eliminating the employees from the account. We certainly support eliminating accredited investors from the account. Um, but we would also like to, we'd like to see that analysis that is going to be prepared. This, limit, it, this limits access to capital for these small businesses. And it, eliminate, it, it limits, uh, Mr. Koster, it eliminates your ability to, to uh, access capital and, um, and grow your company and grow your headcount, too, right? Yes. I think, okay. I think it has a slowdown. In, I think that the chart not shown up there is the decrease in venture capital investment, and I think that is also attributable to the lack of liquidity in the IPO markets. That, I think, has a downstream effect that, that limits the early stage investment rather than just the late stage IPO investment. It has a, a double-edged sword, decreasing employment numbers as well. Well, it is important. It's, it, this chart is interesting to look at in terms of the number of IPOs. Uh, I think many Americans misunderstand what IPO is about. It is in, in order to get capital injected into your company, right, and to free up maybe the, some of the capital you have got invested in. Uh, but but long term, it is really about accessing capital for that company so they can grow, grow jobs and actually grow larger. That is the reason why you have shareholders that want to participate, right? Uh, Mr. Macy, will you discuss the 500 shareholder cap, uh, your views on it? Um, and uh, sort of where you'd like to see this thing go? Uh, well, certainly. Uh, I just want to make two points about it. First, um, I'm against the 500 share cap. Um, I, I, I think that particularly with respect to employees, it provides uh, a real uh, a curb on the ability of, of companies to provide uh, um, incentives that, that are different than cash compensation. The point I want to make, though, that hasn't been made yet is simply to, to uh, observe that there is a very close correlation between the 500 shareholder rule and a whole bunch of other rules. So, for example, we heard this morning the, that something the SEC is very proud of, and, and I'm not uh, uh, opposed to it, is their uh, reform a couple of years ago to say that employee stock options are exempt from this 500 count. So you can give all the options you want without coming under the 500 count norm. But what, what I don't think the SEC fully grasp, and it relates to the 500 shareholder rule, is it doesn't do me very much good to have an option to buy a share of stock if that share of stock is not publicly traded or if there are big impediments to that company making an IPO. Similarly, with respect to the 500, with respect to the 500 shareholder rule, uh, it, it, let's say we, we exempt employees, we raise the, the, the number to some sensible level. It, we need to go beyond that to really help the uh, U.S. economy create jobs because we need to, we, we need to make the, that stock grant, just like the option grant, worth something to the employees, and it becomes worth something the more liquidity it has, the more a uh, access that company has to the, to the public offering market. So I think the 500 shareholder rule is a terrific step in, in the right direction, but it is almost a cruel joke if you say to a, uh, an employee, here are, your, you know, here are your options or here are your shares, but you know, it is too risky and, and for us to go to public, so uh, you know, these shares are going to be uh, restricted forever. That is that's, you know, not a great deal, in my view. Thank you. Now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am very open to the idea of uh, changing the general solicitation rules and also the 500-person limit. I do think, though, that this hearing, as good as it has been, has only really highlighted two pieces of the puzzle, and it is a very large puzzle. Having been an investment banker, I think that the structure of the investment banking industry is also uh, very important to this. Uh, there have been a few glancing blows dealt to that topic, but the fact that analysts find it difficult to make a living following stocks, especially smaller stocks, is a fundamental problem. But that also implies that the retail investor needs the help of an analyst, and ideally the help of an honest analyst that won't just 
boosts the stocks that that company happens to be underwriting at the time. There are many issues in the structure of the investment banking field. One of them is the fact that proprietary trading has become so lucrative that it makes pretty much all fee-based services pale in comparison. And then that sets up a conflict of interest issue if they are, in fact, betting against the interest of their own clients. So that is a whole deep segment of the problem. Another problem is that many retail investors have the idea that all IPOs are automatically good. Well, many of them are disasters. Many of them are a search for the dumbest dollars they can find in America, overly valuing a company and leaving a poor retail investor holding the bag who perhaps has been seduced by an overly optimistic analyst report. So the search for the informed invest investor is truly a difficult task. We saw this in one of the least heralded uh, features of our recent uh, recession, money market funds. Most everybody has a brokerage account. And who knew? Who knew whether the investors were accredited or not? The risk of breaking the buck on those funds. And I think the government had to step in with, perhaps the chairman can remind me, wasn't it a $3 trillion seat-of-your-pants guarantee, which may have been one of the most fundamental features of the bailout. Basically, everybody in America was bailed out, and no one wants to talk about that. Now, there are other features to that puzzle, but that should strike the heart of every investor out there, even, I imagine, some university endowment funds that didn't really, didn't really know. So it, it seems to me that one of the core issues here, since really money, according to most investment bankers, really isn't the issue. It's a question of company valuation. And who wants to acknowledge that? And the phrase in the business is, uh, you don't bet on the horse, you bet on the jockey. And the real shortage is not money, it is management talent and experience. But these are some of the unacknowledged puzzle pieces, I think, that are out there. So um, I commend the Chairman for holding this hearing. I know that he's founded a very successful company in his own right. But getting this right for the whole country is really going to be a challenge, because financial literacy probably has not increased over the years. And I'm not sure that television advertising helps us a whole lot in <laughs> understanding this. So I shudder at the thought of some of these general solicitations that could be amazingly appealing, but really just be hiding an investment that's not necessarily going to grow to the sky. So uh, I commend the expertise of the panelists, but this is indeed a deep issue. And you should be comforted in the fact that this committee has no legislative jurisdiction. So this is primarily just a debating society. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would the gentleman yield? I would be delighted. We have a little bit. We do regulate you know, the post office, and we have got the <laughs> District of Columbia. Uh, but I want to thank the gentleman. Uh, as you know, we didn't come into this hearing with predetermination. Certainly the Chairwoman uh, Shapiro was very quick to say she knows some of these reforms have to happen, and it is mostly her mandate. And, I think it's one of the reasons we want to have uh, the encouragement of the SEC and support while recognizing that most of it is for her to do, not, in fact, for us to do. But I thank the gentleman for being here. With that, we recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this would be for the whole panel. Um, if you care to comment on the efficacy or constitutionality of the general solicitation ban, um, I would like to hear your perspectives, not all at once. Well, it is easy for me to do because I am not a lawyer, but I can read the English language. Are you language. bragging? <laughs> Sounds like you are bragging when you say yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I can read the English language, however, and the First Amendment to me is very clear. And it seems to me there is a definite conflict there. And given a conflict, I prefer to go with the Constitution. Mr. Macy, you look like you were gearing up to respond. I was winding up there a little bit. Um, so th there are t 
two kind of stylized facts around this issue on either side. One is, I think Congressman Issa made this point that it is absolutely nonsensical to think that a pharmaceutical company has the right to advertise on television a prescription medication and a, a company can't make a, a similar solicitation for securities. So when you get off the airplane in Europe, you see that, that all the time. The problem that lawyers have, I think, on the other hand, with this, the issue that you raise about the general solicitation is that if we start putting SEC rules, uh, Congressman, under scrutiny from a First Amendment constitutional lens, um, we have opened up a real Pandora's box. Because think about just the Securities Act of 1933, the registration statement. That is a prior restraint on the press to say to a company, you can't send this this document out to investors without going to jail until the Division of Corporation Finance at the SEC says it's okay. That is also a, a First Amendment violation, other than the fact, in, in fact, something that is very commonly said around law schools, I don't think people have, have really, uh, it is quite, quite amusing, is um, um, that, that uh, it's one thing one learns in law school is uh, uh, an unwritten rule of the, of, of the United States is that the First Amendment doesn't apply to the SEC. Um, I was kind of astonished, actually, the best, the best part of this hearing for me by far was uh, when uh, 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 the chair of the SEC said, well, I, you know, it, maybe this is unconstitution, but I, constitutional, but I have to, to uphold the law, and so I am going to ignore the Constitution where it conflicts with the law. That is not the way I learned the kind of hierarchy of documents in our, in our system, but uh, that is the world we live in. There certainly is precedent for uh, executive branch entities. Uh, not following laws that they believe are unconstitutional, even recent examples of it. Uh, I think that you have a moral obligation, if not a legal obligation, if you are the head of a U.S. administrative agency, to resign rather than enforce, enforce a law that you actually believe is unconstitutional. Let me move to one other uh, area, and if I have any time left, I will yield to the chairman, who is a, an expert in this area, and I clearly am not. Uh, I think it may have been you, Mr. Macy, or it may have been you, uh, Dr. Ron, that commented on the perverse incentive to go after big fines because that is the way we judge success. And I tend to judge enforcement more by uh, active prison sentences than I do the size of the fine. So uh, accepting that the SEC is not the United States Attorney's Office, are you satisfied with the level of criminal prosecutions for fraud? Uh, and if not, what can be done about it? Um, I think that if one looks at, for example, financial fraud, particularly insider trading prosecutions, I think that the, uh, the, uh, the problem that the government tends to have is just as a general rule is uh, that they, uh, they, uh, they um, overcharge. That is to say, and I think they're, they're I mean, you know, there are, there are, um, current prosecutions that I that could be cited as an example, but there are many, many examples that if somebody has done three things that are, you know, involve really criminal fraud, I have never understood why the government would charge them with, you know, a hundred count indictment where when you get to the number 97, 98, 99, 100, these are pretty big stretches as to whether the, the fraud applies to that conduct. Uh, whereas, you know, I do think of somebody where people are actually ripping people off. Let's 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 go after them. So that's one big uh, uh, problem that I have. That that um, uh, the, 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 we the, for 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 I think what are structural bureaucratic reasons um, there are incentives that, for example, the SEC has to say, you know, everything is illegal unless we say it's legal. I think it would be more helpful if they if they said, you know, where you've actually really committed fraud here in these situations where we know we have, because the structure of a criminal trial is once the criminal defense attorneys cast doubt on a few of these items, then, then the government can't come in and say, oh, well, we weren't really serious about charging those. Here's what we really want the guy to go to jail for. So I think we need to be more selective and, and, and go after real fraud. Another thing is, who are we really protecting? Somebody mentioned in the first panel, gee, isn't this great that we um, fine Goldman Sachs so much money uh, with respect to this CDO scandal and the way it was selling 
uh, uh, structured products to investors. I always like to remind my students that the, the people who were ripped off in that case were two financial institutions. One of them was IKB Deutsche Industria Bank, uh, a Dusseldorf, Germany headquartered bank, and the other was ABNN AMRO, a giant financial institution in the Netherlands. This is not, this prosecution is not helping the U.S. small investors, not even helping U.S. investors. It's certainly not helping small investors. I, I would disagree with you, but, but, but when, you, when you rob another poor person, we call it common law robbery. And when you rob a rich company, uh, we call it something else. And if for no other reason other than to just prop up what's left of public trust in our criminal justice system, I would just like to see more uh, uh, suits prosecuted and, and fewer uh, folks who don't have the means to defend themselves. No, no, I agree. My point is simply that I'd like to see more suits brought where the person who's being ripped off is not ABN and AMRO. There are plenty of small investors who are being ripped off as well, and I think that I'd rather have my tax dollars going to, to protect those guys. But, but I agree with you in general. More is, is better. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. For a change, I'm going to go last, not first, so I'll yield myself five minutes. Mr. Silbert, the people that are on your, the companies that are on your exchange, what's the number? How many of them are audited? Uh, 100 percent of the companies are audited. So they have the same audit standard as public companies, right? I, 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 right let me rephrase that. They have uh, audits as required for yeah, public companies. Correct. The auditors tend to be the big four accounting firms. Right. I, I, I realize if you want Goldman to take your, your public offering, the first thing you have to do is go to what used to be the kind of the big ten, the big, big eight, the big six, and now the big four, uh, which is becoming interesting since one of them has to give you a, a, debt, a, a credit or, sorry, a debt uh, evaluation. Another one can do something else. Pretty soon you run out of them able to do anything for you. But uh, so whether you use PricewaterhouseCoopers or a regional audit firm, the audit standard uh, for GAAP is exactly the same, isn't it? Correct. So the standard for a accounting firm standing behind a qualified opinion is going to be the same for these companies, whether they are public or private. Isn't that right? Correct. Well, let, me, let me go through that, that sort of analogy. We talked about the First Amendment. Mr. Mr. Or Dr. Ron, you, uh, you were pretty straightforward. You know, you, as a non-lawyer like myself, you, know, you read this very short chapter written long ago, and you know, it's, it shall not be abridged. Boom, move on. But let me ask a, a series of questions to you just to make sure that we understand the nuances. I've got an audited public, a public accounting firm has done my audit. Right now, if I print it in the newspaper, or I give it to one of my investors, and they post it on the Internet, I have committed no violation, right? But if I send it out to a group of potential investors, I have committed a violation, right? So, so if I send it out to just those people I know could legally invest, I have committed a violation. Well, in fact, if I give it to The New York Times or somebody posted on the Internet, it's, just, it's fine on my Facebook, right? I just can't drive people to my Facebook. So when we talk about First Amendment, and, and it sounds very lofty, and sometimes when you go to the Constitution, you sometimes lose the C-SPAN audience because they say, oh, well, that's, a, that's not a recent document. The recent document of posting something on Facebook being okay, while not being able to go to investors of record who do this kind of investing repeatedly and sending them information and soliciting them currently is not available. Well, let's go one step further, though. If J.P. Morgan and Goldman are being paid by my firm to go out and find people, that's okay, right? They can go solicit the people who have accounts with them, and they already know they can be qualified, right? All the major firms have, and I'm getting yeses, so let the record indicate those are all yeses. Uh, she's very good, but she doesn't hear pantomime. Uh, so let's understand that, the, that right now the current status quo allows large brokerage firms to make these markets. And, Mr. Silbert, you are larger than you once were, but you are not a conventional brokerage firm. You don't have a whole bunch of, and correct me if I am wrong, you don't have a whole bunch of people paid commissions to go make these transactions, right? 
Um, so we do not have a distribution network like a Goldman Sachs, that is correct. But right now for Goldman and J.P. Morgan and many other, uh, we'll, we'll just, you always use Goldman because of their size, but we could use Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, too. They can, in fact, make these markets, have hundreds of investors behind a single name, and it's okay. It's just not okay for me to post to my Facebook and drive people to go look at it and consider investing, even if they're qualified. Is that the status quo we're dealing with? And as a, as a former startup lawyer, it's one of those rules that's oftentimes you know, mystical to the, to the individual who's doing it, but there's a lot of different ways that people wind up kind of finding magical ways to solicit without soliciting. Well, now, uh, the chairman, when she was here, was unable to answer hypothetical questions for good reasons. She's doing a due diligence, and I commend her for starting this process. But you all are here to answer the hypothetical. So uh, I hope that you knew that was the reason. Hypothetically, if the SEC lifts the cap on uh, uh, the 5499 on all those who are, in fact, employees receiving options and those options maturing, because that ultimately makes them stockholders, that is okay with all of you. Is that right? Yes. And if they take, and hypothetically, the SEC develops a standard that they oversee, in other words, an SEC list of qualified investors, and they lift the cap on that list of investors, those who, either with the help of a J.P. Morgan or Goldman or somebody, or on their own, fill out a form and show that they, in fact, should be not part of a limit, limit protection in this kind of investment, and she takes the cap off. Is that okay with all of you? Yes. So as we close, and a ranking member may want a, another round, but as I close, we have two major items here. The employee who, who has a benefit limited unless we take the cap off for them, and the qualified investor who either is limited because there's only 499 options or is unlimited because they're a conduit through, if we allow for that direct and a solicitation of those registered investors, that's good with everyone on this panel. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I'll take that as a yes from everyone. Uh, I hope that as the, the Chairman content, considers all this that uh, you are all listened to. Uh, would the Ranking Member have like another round? Okay. When, with that, we, uh, as we said earlier, for seven days the record will remain open. That includes all of you to revise and extend. And uh, I thank all of you for your testimony. We stand adjourned.